muted now. Hold on. There we go. Oops, did I hit something wrong? No, there I am, Mike. I said, yeah, all right. I have everything and my little screen. Now I just gotta find where those, my mouse is a hand. There you go. Okay, hover to the edge. No. And go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm not seeing the full screen fit to window. There you go. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning for you folks that are on the West Coast. My name is Len Statham. I will be moderating today's webinar. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the, the New York Association of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services, NIAPERS. And we are very pleased to offer this webinar, COVID-19, the CARES Act, and other federal legislation, the facts that you need to know. And we are lucky that we have uh, Ray Sabula with us again today. Uh, we had, this is really a part of, a second part to our first webinar. We had so many questions uh, that we really felt like we needed to bring Ray back. Things are, have changed just in the last two weeks. And it just makes a lot of sense um, to have another webinar. And actually, um, we've got Ray for the entire hour. We didn't have Ray for the, the entire hour last time, so we are delighted that um, we've got him for the last hour. And uh, I, last webinar, I really didn't introduce Ray other than say, here's Ray. <laughs> I do want to let you know that Ray is, uh, has his law degree from Franklin Pierce Law Center. Um, in 1982. He has spent uh, 23 years uh, working with le legal service and protection advocacy programs um, and uh, providing direct representation to uh, disabled individuals uh, with legal issues with us, uh, Social Security. And then um, he's been with Cornell for the last uh, 20 years, actually. And uh, we are glad because he is a resource that we've used. He's trained me personally. He's trained uh, a lot of folks in, on, in uh, Cornell's Work Incentive uh, Practitioner Credentialing Program. So, Ray, we've got a lot of people uh, on the uh, webinar today, so take it away. All right, thanks, Len. Um, good to be here with everybody. This stuff, um, as Len said, has been changing yeah, daily. It's a, 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 you know, we've gotten to the point where we are calming down. I like to say we are lowering the curve you know, <laughs> you know on the changes that have happened since that cares act has been passed um so what we're going to do is go through these slides i'm going to point out in the slides what has changed um and len has a fact sheet that went out um i guess it's number six thousand 492 um, and he'll set he'll circulate that to everybody um, and he gets them apparently all the time so he can do with them what he wants if he wants to keep sending them around because there'll be another one this Friday with some new changes um, but the changes are getting smaller and fortunately they're not issues with what this means anymore it's more issues about how this is happening um, which is critically important and not always a great story. Um, but we are going to start with the CARE Act. There were two other uh, COVID bills that were passed, kind of without anybody really knowing it, you know, and they didn't have too much to deal with our clients. Um, but this CARES Act brought those two to light and they're all merged in here. Uh, and just an FYI, there is potentially another one coming out to fix a lot of what was broken and a lot of the assumptions uh, that the feds made when they started trying to give our folks money. So we're still talking about a ball of confusion. We are going crazy. Um, you know, COVID-19 has changed our world. It's not a pretty world right now, as you all know from the five o'clock news. Um, and we are reopening and seeing 
cases increase. Um, so this is going to be a while, guys, you know, and we're going to talk about what is happening to our clients' benefits in the meanwhile, you know, what happens to all of this stuff. Um, what happens to that stimulus? How does the stimulus get paid? How do people claim for their dependents? And what are they going to be able to do now that both the Title II and the SSI deadlines have passed? As you know, this was a big, big piece of legislation. Um, and it dealt with everything. Um, primarily hotels and cruise lines and you know airlines there was a bit of it that dealt with our clients um, and left us with as many questions um, and issues that will be dealt with after this crisis um, so i'm believing we're going to see this crisis end at some point but then we're gonna end up in a situation where our clients go into a benefits crisis based on what was done and what wasn't done. All of the agencies have pretty much shut down, they've locked their doors, and they are working from home, which means there's non-essential work and essential work. When we look at Social Security in particular, all of the return to work issues are non-essential work. If a client reports income and it's supposed to lower their benefit, we don't care. We're not dealing with that. We will deal with reports that would result in an increase in benefits. So the result is people are getting money that they may not be entitled to through this crisis. And we're going to have to deal with the fallout when this is over. Again, continues to be a moving target. As I said earlier, the moving target is no longer what this stuff means. I think everybody understands that at this point. But we do have still federal agencies that are playing games and doing different things um, and telling the same person who's looking for information very different things. Um, so we can still expect some changes to happen. I'm believing we can still expect this crisis to go a little bit longer than the end of December uh, when the unemployment extension rolls out. Um, and expect surprises. Take, for example, that Title II, the SSDI deadline, that was, I think, April 22nd. That was announced on the 20th. Complete surprise that there was going to be a deadline for that. So we gave people two days to get on the IRS site to claim their dependents. You can imagine how many people miss that. Um, the Social Security, the SSI population had about two weeks notice but there are so many issues with that population that my guess is thousands upon thousands of people have missed their opportunity to get that stimulus payment and will now be told to wait until next tax year to get it. So we're gonna try to go through this real quick, um, even though we went through it real, real quick two weeks ago, we're gonna go through it real quick. Um, the whole notion, you know, my, my life is absorbed in benefits planning, taking somebody with a disability on benefits and getting them to work. And how does this all balance out so this person can finally be financially independent? All of those people have been laid off. You know, so we are now taking our benefits planning knowledge and our return to work knowledge and undoing it. We're helping people unplan from work. And by that, I mean maximizing their benefits. They're gonna go back onto Social Security, back onto SSI, onto unemployment, get their SNAP benefits, potentially TANF, and we're gonna build that benefits pyramid back up again 
knowing very well that in three or four or five months, we're going to start chomping at it again because people will be returning to work as the economy opens up. Um, but I think it's just as important to unplan for people right now so that they can meet their basic needs. And yeah, I made that up. I made unplanning up and I think it makes sense given how the world has turned over. The stimulus payments um, are still probably the biggest question of the, the entire bill. They've been the question that I've been answering a thousand times since this thing started. They even changed the name of them. They're now economic impact payments. You know, so I will get a question about the EIP, and I'm not quite sure what it means because it was a stimulus payment at first. So the names are changing, whether they're changed on purpose is beyond me, but I am a skeptic and believe that hiding the ball for our population is the name of the game. It provided direct payments to the American people. You know, the last time this happened was during the Great Recession. Uh, and of course, some people get it, other people get a little bit, and some people don't get anything. You know, if your adjusted gross income was under 75,000 bucks, or as a married couple, $150,000, you would get a payment. You know, if you were filing as head of household with one child and your adjusted gross income was under 112,500, you would get a payment. If you're a couple, that payment was $2,400. Each member of the couple got a $1,200 payment. Then they added that kicker, and this kicker was confusing, very confusing. It said dependent child, and we all thought we knew what that meant because we've all filed taxes, but it's not what it meant. Basically, a dependent child was defined by taking two different laws and merging them together. And it became a child under the age of 17 in school. And each child who met that definition got $500. Big issue that came up was that our folks don't file taxes. So that's what we gotta talk about. Now the example here that we did and the first time we did it, the numbers were wrong, but, but I can't count. Mom and dad filing jointly with three kids are gonna receive a payment of $3,900. Now, they phased out so that if you get to the point where you have two people without kids with adjusted gross income of $198,000, there's no payment available at all. These stimulus payments are not taxable. They've been called tax credits. They've been called advances. So everybody assumed that, okay, just like happened in 2008, next year we're gonna have to claim this as income. Well, that is not the case. These are not taxable. We'll not, we will not be paying income tax on them last, for next year. Hey, we have an interesting question. I wanted to get it out of the way. Um, we have a question. Somebody had indicated, what if a person is not working and they don't receive benefits? Are they entitled to a stimulus payment? You know, these are payments to the American people. So yes. And when I drive through Santa Fe in the shopping area and see homeless people on each corner, you know, it's, it kills me to know that they're not working they're not playing the game that society requires us to play for whatever reason, and they're entitled to these payments, and they're likely not getting them. They're not on the radar screen, and our radar screen right now is focused on somebody who's at least receiving benefits and hopefully filing taxes. But yes, everybody should be getting it. Thank you, Ray. 
All right, so how does this impact other benefits? This is straight from the law, with the exception of the things in parens, because I paraphrase them. Notwithstanding any other provision of law, any stimulus payment, or EIP, made to an individual under the CARES Act shall not be taken into account as income and shall not be taken into account as a resource for 12 months from the date of receipt for any federal, state, or local program financed in whole or in part with federal funds. Now that's almost everything. The only thing you can take out of this, which could be affected, are state-only payments. So I'm looking at state-funded housing. I'm looking at potentially general relief, if in fact a general relief payment still exists anywhere in this country. Um, but otherwise, this should not, the $1,200 and the $500 kickers should not be seen as income for anything. Yeah, and if somebody does keep it, that family with $3,900 may not spend it all at once. They may be allocating it out. Yeah, it will not be a resource for any program for 12 months. And we know that's pretty much happening. We know that's pretty much happening. You know, HUD has said these payments will not count towards rent. HUD has no resource limits. SNAP has said, no, for food stamp purposes, we are not counting the $1,200 and it won't be a resource. SSI, the same thing. So I think everybody's playing the game properly with the stimulus. The question was how to get it. So you know that SSI has a $2,000 resource limit. If that mom and dad, and I know this is a foolish example because it's probably not real, but let's play with the $3,900. Receive $3,900. That would not count in the month that it's received as income. Now, normally, that would have bumped them out of SSI completely, but it doesn't count. That payment, if it's kept into the next month, usually becomes a resource, but it's excluded for resources for 12 months. So we're looking at a family with somebody on SSI who could potentially have, let's see, we had a married couple with a kid, Okay, so we could potentially have $6,900 in the bank. $3,000 that is a countable resource for SSI plus the stimulus payment. And they're still eligible for benefits. Now my guess is because of the way the American public uses their money and the lack of savings that you know, most people have less than $500 to fall back on, um, and this is a pretty big emergency, that this money's gone, you know, that it came into checking accounts and is gone. You know, it went into some account and it's taken out immediately. So it was pretty simple for SSI recipients. Now, how does an SSI recipient get a check? The SSDI population, the Title II population, Social Security has well, Social Security has all the information for everybody. So I'm not quite sure why, but the Title II population, SSDI, um, the retirees, you know, who were filing taxes, were getting paid automatically in the same way that they got paid. That has changed significantly. Um, the first confusion came up with the SSI population because there was one morning when I looked at the website and Social Security's website said, uh, don't call us, we don't have anything to do with this, go on the IRS website. Then I went onto the IRS website and it said, don't file anything yet, we're gonna fix this. And then I went on to Treasury's website, which says if you have not filed taxes in 2018 or 2019, you need to get on the IRS website to file that non-filer form. 
So it was complete chaos for a couple of weeks. But we need to look at SSI recipients, retirees, and VA pension benefits. So recipients of the VA pension, which are those people who are aged, non-service connected disabilities, and poor, uh, who are getting a very minimal payment uh, from the VA. And if these people had not filed taxes in 2018 or 19, they were required to file the non-filer form, um, which was not a big deal. It was a 15 minute process. You know, the problem being, look at who's there. The poorest of the poor, most with either age or significant disabilities. And the assumption was made that these people are all sitting at home with their laptops and their internet connections, so there's no problem. But that's not real for our people, and we all know that. Our people don't have laptops. Most of them don't have internet connections. You know, the Santa Fe Public Schools, when they closed, gave every student, depending on their age, either an iPad or a laptop. And they realized that some of these people don't have internet connections and put up hotspots all over the city so that people without connections could access it. Well, the feds didn't do that. They didn't put up hotspots. And the public libraries are closed. And the VITA income tax centers are closed. So what were people to do? They were coming to us. And I hope that we were able to help them. You know, when we were unplanning from work, you know, I do know of benefits planners and agencies who actually got on the phone with people and sat down every 15 minutes with another person and did inputs to get this stuff going. Right now, all of the deadlines have passed. Social Security uh, issued something on the 6th because the last deadline was May 5th that said, don't worry about it, you can file again next year. You know, I am telling people that IRS non-filer site is still up and running. File anyway. If you don't have a direct deposit, leave the bank information blank. You'll get a paper check. If you do, this is an opportunity, folks. We can take our people who have been cashing their checks at, cash, at check cashing stores, get them banked, and submit something to the IRS that gives them direct deposit information, which might get things quicker. You know, we know that there's a fix bill pending in Congress now. We know that there are other stimulus bills pending in Congress. And if a fix bill comes out to pay these people, and it is intended to pay the people that were missed, and our clients already have something on file with the IRS, it might happen real quick. It might happen real quick. So I'm telling people, do it. There's likely going to be a fix. There may be another round of payments to everybody. And if their information's already on the IRS website, they'll be all set. Now, these are the zero filers. In order to do this, you know, to get that $500 per dependent, that dependent must have been claimed on a tax return. Must be under 17 and in school. Now, I know you're all thinking, you know, there are other dependents out there who are being claimed on other people's taxes. But if you are over the age of 17, you're out of luck. That's part of the fix. You know, and it was actually called Every American Matters, you know, to get those dependents who are still living with parents and are 34, 35, 50, because they don't have the capacity to live on their own. They're dependents, but they're not eligible for payments and they should be. They must be related to you. 
the dependent can't provide more than 50% of his or her own support during the tax year. That makes sense. Must be a citizen, a US national, or US resident alien with a valid social security number. We certainly don't wanna tell anybody who is undocumented and using a social security number to file with the IRS online. That's something to stay away from. And you need to live with the filer for at least half the year. You know, that's where this last little thing was bumping all of the college students up. They're not living at home for at least half of the year. You know, we all argue that our SSI kids who go to college and are living away at college are living with their parents because their parents are maintaining a room. And that's real, so that their address is with their parents. But not for this $500. It missed all of those college students because they don't meet all six of these criteria. So that is supposed to be fixed as well. Again, I've got to echo this because this is really critical. It's an opportunity to get our unbanked clients banked. You know, direct deposit is the way of the world now, and you're going to get your money quicker. You know, their, the original um, estimate was that direct deposit would happen real quick. It would happen in April. So most people should have gotten that last month. But a paper check could take until September. You know, it's daily I'm getting emails. Well, I didn't get a check for this yet. I didn't get a check here. I got part of it, but not the other part. You know, and people are totally messed up with this. Um, so the direct deposit is the best way to go. And getting that set up with Social Security is something that you can do. Um, although I wouldn't recommend you do it because it's a long, long wait on the phone to get it done. But um, if our clients can get that done and get direct deposit set up, it's time to get our people into banks or credit unions. Now, if we look at Title II benefits, <clears throat> we're talking SSDI, Childhood Disability Benefits, and Disabled Widows Benefits. No impact on benefits at all, because these are insurance benefits. So the stimulus will not be included in any taxation determination, it is unearned income because people have not provided labor to get this money. So for the Title II program, there is no issue at all, which made it very easy just to give all these people money because Social Security had all that information. Tax filings for Title II, it was not necessary. However, you know, same advice goes if your Title II people are not banked. You know, get them banked. And if your Title II person, whether they are a retiree or one of those disability groups that we just mentioned, has not filed taxes in 2018 or 2019, in order to get the dependent $500, they needed to file a non-filer form. The why is beyond me. Social Security has the necessary information for those folks because they're potentially paying those dependents benefits as well. SNAP benefits. Stimulus payments will have no impact. This SNAP program meets the definition of a federally funded program that is needs-based. Um, so there's not going to be any impact on the $1,200, and it will not be a resource for 12 months. You know, it should not be impacting anything. HUD, same thing. HUD made a direct statement that $1,200 will not be used in rental determinations, and there's no resource limit for HUD anyway. You know, so the $1,200, you know, which will be gone within a year, you know, if it's saved, we find that one person in the country who has saved it, what would happen is the income that's produced by that resource would count as income 
for rental purposes. But we all know that bank interest is pretty much meaningless uh, at this point in time. All right, HUD also has mortgage securities and they're looking at providing people with forbearance um, you know reduced payments deferred payments you know for up to six months and if necessary and the person requests it another six months but notice on this first bullet single family hold owners holding HUD insured loans now that's not necessarily FHA loans they are HUD insured. So we got to check and make sure who is providing that insurance and make sure it's HUD. Because if it's anybody else, the forbearances are just going to be done through, through goodwill of the businesses that are holding them. Um, I know that banks most certainly are not foreclosing on people. They are trying to deal with people, cut them some slack either forbearances, reduced payments, but the interest is still compounding uh, during this period of time. Medicaid, good news here, nothing but good news. All 50 states accepted an increase in Medicaid funding. As you know, Medicaid is a federal and state funded program. In most states, it's 50-50. If you look at some of the poorer states, Alabama, Mississippi, it's 80% federal funded and 20% state funded. The CARES Act gave an extra 6.2% at the state's option. But if the state took it, they agreed to have a moratorium on Medicaid terminations for anyone who had Medicaid before the crisis began or became eligible during the crisis, which is all of our people who stopped working. You know, so that's a very powerful thing because we know exactly where this is going. You know, what happens when somebody becomes unemployed? You know, unemployment has changed dramatically and unfortunately does not have the same protections. So we could have somebody who's re receiving unemployment nowadays who is totally out of luck with SSI cash, but can't be terminated from Medicaid. It's not a bad financial deal, not a bad financial deal at all. And that stimulus payment has no impact on Medicaid. It's not income and it will not be counted as a resource. Medicaid has the same $2,000 and $3,000 resource limit, but this stimulus payment along with the dependents will not count. What can happen? You know, there's a Medicaid house uh, when we train new planners um, that has lots of rooms in it, and it has rooms like Medicaid. It has rooms like the buy-in. It has you know, the, I think the attic is the Medicaid expansion, you know, and the CHIP program and all the different programs. It is possible that the states can change somebody's status during this period of time. Folks who were working and receiving Medicaid under 1619B or a Medicaid buy-in may be switched to regular Medicaid because of the change in status. They're no longer working. That's okay. Yeah, and you're from all different states. So the rumor is very true. If you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one. Figure out how this is working in your state and who is moving people. Can't be terminated, but could change status. Hey, I got a ton of questions, but this, this question is really, uh, about what you're talking about. So if a person is, uh, has been let go and they had the Medicaid buy-in program, uh, you indicated that they were gonna go um, back on Medicaid, um, but would it be the spend down where they have a lot of money that they have to spend down to? Oh, I, you know, the spend down, that's an actually, that's actually a very good question. You know, I'm not sure the spend down is, 
I'm not sure the spend down's in there, but you know, I'm gonna write it down. Okay. Well, I'll send it to you, right? Okay, you'll send it to me. Oh, thank you, Len. <laughs> I'm really not sure. I hope not, because that's just going to mess people up. Um, a, 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 some other questions. I'd love to just see if we can just bang a couple of these out real quick. Yeah. You had indicated um, um, uh, lots of really good information. One uh, question was, um, if folks are receiving extra money, um, per hour for hazard pay, does that money count towards SGA? You know, Social Security has issued yet another brilliant instruction that's going to end up not only messing our clients up, but messing us up and messing Social Security up. The pay is going to be treated like any other pay, which means that if you get a $2 or $5 bump because you're working in a grocery store, and that pushes you over SGA, you're not entitled to your Title II check. You may be using trial work periods because of that $2 bump and not even knowing it. Yeah. You know, that is going to create complete havoc when Social Security opens again and realizes how many people are being overpaid because of hazard pay. Yeah. You know, but you got to think about it. If you were making 150 bucks a week, and now all of a sudden you're making $180 a week, and they're doing the same job, can we use the Social Security rules to make that not count? It sounds like a bonus that's not based on productivity at all. It sounds like there might be a subsidy there because you're not actually earning that much money. So I think we're gonna be seeing a lot of overpayments where we're going to, and I want you to, file requests for reconsideration. Because the overpayments are gonna be wrong. They should probably not exist if you take away that hazard pay. And I really want to bump up Social Security's caseload so that they go into panic mode. And when they go into panic mode, they're more likely to say, wait a minute, these were all subsidies. None of them are overpayments and they just waive everything. And we can force that through advocacy. You know, just by filing a piece of paper on their behalf. Yeah. You know, so I think we, we need to watch that. Because that, yeah, I mean, it, yes, it is hazard pay. Yes, these people deserve that money, but it should not be taking away work incentives that are intended to be knowingly and purposefully used. Uh, another question here, Ray. Um, uh, if a stimulus hits a bank account and there's a lot of overdraft fees, um, will those overdraft fees be uh, waived or does that depend on the bank? I would like to say it would depend on the bank. <laughs> <laughs> experience is showing that it doesn't depend on the bank. The I mean, it may not be happening in credit unions. Um, you know, the only thing that the CARES Act allowed for intercepts of stimulus was for back child support. Um, and I think we all understand that one. But the first day these payments issued was the time the first call came and the bank took it for overdraft fees, because the account was overdrawn, because there were bad, there were credit card debts. You know, so the banks have been scooping this up. There's been some talk, you know, and all I can say is that it's talk of banks slowing that down because they're really getting a bad rap for doing this. You know, there was also on the other side of that, let me add that nursing homes were taking Medicaid residents stimulus payments and adding it to the cost of care. You know, that needs to be reported to your state Medicaid agency because the cost of care did not go up $1,200 in one month. Yeah. You know, there are lots of ways this money has been disappearing, you know, and turning into a bailout for banks. And we need to make sure that stops. Another question, how will the unused resources um, be treated if co-mingled with other funds? Well, you know, once the 12 months is over, 
If it's co-mingled and you're over-resourced, you're over-resourced. Okay. Yeah, that's generally how they're going to look at it. And they are going to be co-mingled. But, you know, uh, it's a great question. It really is. I just want you to find the person who saved $1,200 <laughs> for a year. <laughs> and, Ray, what if an adult claims their parent as a dependent who receives SSI? Do they receive a stimulus payment or do they not? Because they, they're not actually, a, you know. A, yeah, that SSI recipient would not receive an SSI. Uh, that $500 bump for dependents because they don't, they're not under 17 in school. If the bill goes through, um, and unfortunately it's a Democratic House bill, to fix that, to allow every American to get paid that $500, they would get a $500 bump. Gotcha. Yeah, and it, you know, when we're talking about that type of person, we also have to consider their status. If they're a non-tax filer and at home on SSI, then yes, they would. If they're working and filing taxes, they may be entitled to a $1,200 payment. You know, it all depends on whether or not they're actually claimed as a dependent by somebody else on taxes or are their own little household for tax purposes. So just look at the situation real carefully. And Ray, if a client only receives TANF um, for income, should they apply on the IRS website as a non-filer? Yes. Yeah. We have a bunch of other questions, but I, I, I know we want to get to the rest of your presentation. So um, if we do not get your question answered, we will do the same thing that we did the last time, which uh, Ray answered about a hundred questions and uh, <laughs> sent them out to people. So, yes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna warn everybody. Everybody who asks for personal advice gets billed at, by the hour. <laughs> And I'm, I may be living in Santa Fe, but I'm used to Boston billing rates. So, <laughs> and I'm old, so look out. <laughs> I'll intercept your own in stimulus payments. <laughs> All right, so Medicare, no big deal here. Um, you know, we're looking at no impact from the stimulus at all. Um, there was some discussion um, if there were state issues involved with Medicare, but there really aren't now. Um, you know, the part, the Medicare savings plans for Part B and Part D, where somebody's getting extra help or part of the premium or all of the premium paid, are not going to be impacted at all. Now, the only state issue that may possibly pop up you know, the state Medicaid agency is doing the processing for the Medicare savings plan, which of course is a completely federal program. So if your state is saying that this money does count, you need to tell them, unfortunately you're misunderstanding something and it doesn't count. Um, so that would be a state making a mistake or a worker making a mistake which we haven't heard anything about, so that's good news. TANF, the stimulus payments are gonna have no impact at all. Um, again, if there's not a tax filing, we mentioned get on that non-filer form. Um, you know, and help, uh, again, help your clients do that. Same 12 months, TANF meets that basic definition, notwithstanding any other law, so the TANF resource and income are suspended for purposes of the stimulus payment. Veterans pension, you know, the, this is a needs-based program uh, and it's for aged veterans over 65 who are low income or veterans who have disabilities that are not service connected. Um, it pays slightly more than SSI. So we're talking about very poor people or people who are over 65. Yeah, the stimulus is not gonna have an impact on the veteran's pension, nor will it be counted as a resource. The issue is 
how did these veterans get a stimulus payment? You know, that became a very, oops, let me go back one. Oops, I can't do that. Where's the other arrow? I want to go back to that veterans because this is, this is not only nasty because they're veterans, but it's, you know, there was no place for these veterans to go. Um, you, they're at the bottom of the barrel as far as veterans are concerned. They're poor, they're aged, they're not even service connected. So what should we do about them? You know, it's a county by county program. My guess is the vast majority of these folks are missing out on this. And when the fixed bill comes, hopefully they'll be counted. These people also have no access to computers, no access to internet. You know, uh, my mom just passed away in March. She was the computer user. She was the one on Facebook. My dad got his first smartphone and is learning to text. You know, he's 84 years old. He's a veteran. He's not poor and he's not disabled, so he doesn't meet this program. But if he's the typical person we're looking at, there was no way he was gonna get onto a computer and file, because he wouldn't have a clue how to. You know, so that's the people we're dealing with who need to be rescued from this first stimulus, and we need to help them get in line to get some of these benefits. You know, that's, it's just really a sad group because they were truly not thought of during this entire process. Then we come to unemployment, which is a major source of confusion, some of which I'm still confused about. Um, and it seems to be varying from state to state. So you're gonna have to bear with me. I'm gonna tell you what we know. Now, the CARES Act did provide for a $600 a week bump in unemployment for people who were unemployed because of COVID-19. Now, that's a lot of people. And all of the people that we've gotten back to work, oh God, nice. <laughs> sorry. Every time I'm in a webinar, every phone I have goes off. You know? um, so what was I talking about? Unemployment. Every state has a different base period. And it's the period of time that you have to work. It is sometimes a time length, it's sometime an amount of money, sometimes it's both. Washington State, for example, requires you to work for 680 hours in the 12 to 18 months before you file a claim. Well, what if you were on SSI or SSDI and only work 600 hours a month before you filed your claim? you didn't meet the state requirement for unemployment. So the assumption was you're not gonna be eligible for the $600. And that's where we were running with this. I'm still there, but I know there are aberrations going on. And I know the statute tends to read differently than that, but this is what is actually happening. We also had a 13 week extension. Unemployment's generally received for 26 weeks. The CARES Act extended that to 39 weeks and that extension ends, regardless of when you started, on December, of 2000, December 31st of 2020. And here's the $600 that the CARES Act added. Now, when you look at that, that could be a lot of money. You know, it could be an awful lot of money, but the extra $600 ends in July. So if somebody on SSI right now were to be laid off, 
they are going to apply for unemployment benefits. And if they meet their state base period, will get unemployment benefits. They will also get the $600. Now I'm gonna use Washington State because we had to figure it out for a webinar we did specific to Washington State. The minimum payment in Washington State is 188 bucks a week. Now 188 bucks a week, I gotta do my math again, 188 bucks a week times four equals $752 in a four week month. That's enough to allow for a very small SSI payment. But when we add in $2,400, that makes it $3,152 a week. Not bad. Not bad for somebody who is living on SSI. They lose their cash and it goes into suspension for 12 months because of excess income. The CARES Act $600 bump is ending in July. So the most right now that somebody would have would be May, June and July, three months. You have to be in suspension for 12 consecutive months before your SSI will terminate. And remember what we said about Medicaid, all of the states took that extra Medicaid money. So they can't terminate your Medicaid. You're in suspense for three months, you have Medicaid, why not take unemployment in Washington State and get $3,152 a month for three months? When the $600 drops off, you're still in your suspense period, so you contact Social Security and say, $2,400 is gone, I only have $752. They do the math, pay you a small payment, you still have Medicaid. And when we get to December, it still hasn't been 12 months. So we lose unemployment, put me back on Medicaid, put me back on SSI. Hopefully at that point, people have returned to work. But this is really a no loss situation. The question out there right now, and this is only something that's come up in the last week. The bill says something to the effect that if you're not traditionally eligible for unemployment, you can still get the $600. Some people are reading that and saying, well, that means that if I don't meet my state base, I can still get the $600 payment. It's a separate application page for that $600 payment. And I've basically been telling people, if that's how your state's reading this and they're paying the 600 bucks, fill out the extra $600 kicker form and submit it. I know that that's not how it's working in my state or a lot of other states. If people aren't eligible for at least a dollar of state benefits, they're not getting the $600 kicker. I am willing to be proved wrong on this. And it would be great to know. Um, so if you're having a different experience in your state, this is one of the things that's still outstanding. And if it's true, you know, if we really can read that non-traditional eligibility to include people that don't meet the state base period, we're opening up 600 bucks a week for a lot of people. The way I looked at that, when it said non-traditional, it was the self-employed people and you know, Uber and Lyft drivers, those gig employees, you know, who were never eligible for unemployment. I assume that's what that meant, um, but I'm willing to be argued with. So Ray, we've got, uh, we've got three minutes left. I wanna to get to just a couple of oh. questions. Um, if, uh, if someone has unemployment pending, um, and it goes past July, are they able to get retro payment for the date that they applied? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. You know, unemployment is uh, something that should happen fairly quickly. Um, and it's not happening quickly because 33 million people have applied yeah. all at once. Yeah, so so that's like, you know, it, it, the money will go back, even if it's beyond July. Okay. And um, I, uh, I have a, another one related to um, unemployment here. If a person is, uh, are, do they still get the 600 even if they don't meet the base rate requirements because they're working part-time on um, SSDI? You know, part-time workers can meet the base period. They're really insignificant. Um, you know, it's not like you have to work a lot of time. You know, and I mean, they have the hour requirement. I know in Massachusetts you have to have worked for at least six months, but the earnings are like under two thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, if you had, you've got to look at what your state base is. You know, we could have some Title II people who are earning that 1500 bucks in a month, you know, in two months, you know. But the question then is, do you read the Massachusetts base as being both six months and $2,000 or one or the other? It's all, you know, again, if you've seen one unemployment program, you've seen one. You got to look at what your state base is. And that's the question. You know, if somebody does not meet the base period, but we're working, can they be fit into that non-traditionally or non-traditionally eligible, I guess we would call it. You know, um, somebody who was working, was laid off and is not eligible under the regular rules. Um, I'm gonna say, because it has worked in some states, that send that person in and have them file. Okay. If they're right. denied, you know, they're denied. If it works, it works. How about a, how about a client who was working and stayed under SGA uh, because of their IRWA? Um, at, what happens now, now that they're receiving unemployment? Well, those people are receiving unearned income. Uh, and unearned income for Title II folks doesn't count at all. Unemployment is unearned income. Yep. So if they're keeping under SGA using Irwies, it doesn't matter. This is just unearned income. There's money and there's no labor. It doesn't count at all. And uh, uh, probably final question here, Ray. We have a person who's working in the near state uh, psychiatric centers and uh, uh, most of their patients are ineligible for Medicaid and are receiving patient needs accounts uh, resources. Yeah. And a portion of their benefit and their hospital costs comes out of their benefits. So do patients in a psychiatric facility and not working, not active SSI recipients, do they receive a $1,200? Um, you know, they, you know, are, they are active, actually active if they're be if they are SSI recipients, because that SSI state supplement goes way, way up, you know, and those people could be getting fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars in SSI. Of course, it's going to the facility and they're getting their personal needs. Um, the question is, you know, it's been, if they've been there <laughs> before 2018, you know, and haven't filed taxes, they would have likely had to get on that non-payer site. Hmm. Um, you know, Social Security did have information about them um, and the individual is supposed to receive that money in the same way they receive their SSI. Gotcha. Um, it would be the dependence of that child of that person, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, the dependents who would not be getting paid now because they were probably, they were unlikely claimed. Big question here for that group of people. That's getting paid like their SSI, so it's going directly to the facility. That facility is likely the representative payee for that person, and that's how they're getting the money. A rep payee has no control over the stimulus, nor should the psychiatric hospital. That but go, that money should be transferred into the patient needs account, the personal needs account. Gotcha. Okay, great. 
Well, folks, we've come to the end of our hour. I can't believe it's just- That was a quick hour. Uh, oh my God. There's a ton of questions that we haven't been able to get to. Um, we will get to those questions. And, uh, you know, Ray did such a great job last time. I'm sure he'll be willing to do it again. Um, I want to thank um, everybody. And I also definitely want to thank Ray for his time and his expertise on this subject. And uh, wish you all a, a good afternoon. Thanks for yep. tuning in. Appreciate it. Bye now. Right. You're more than welcome. And everybody stay safe.